So hopefully you got to experiment a little bit with lateral force resisting systems. Um, the goal was to try to figure out, you know, pros and cons of different systems and specifically to look at their stiffness. So which of them was stiffer, which deflected less as you tried to push on them. The three main kinds again are a braced frame, a shear wall, and a moment resisting frame. So every building really needs to have some type of one of those three systems. Um, and sometimes they have multiple of those systems. Uh, and we're looking at um, how stiff, how they're going to resist those those applied loads, whether they come from earthquakes or from wind. Um, so you probably found that brace frame was pretty stiff, so using that truss system tends to be very stiff, also very efficient. Um, shear walls can also be very stiff, but they tend to use more material, so there's pros and cons there. From our single degree of freedom system experiments, when we experiment with the single degree of freedom model, we found that stiffer isn't always better, but there's pros and cons. Sometimes we need the stiffness. Um, when we get t buildings that are really tall, um, if they're not stiff enough, they tend to, there's too much motion. There are certain buildings in the world that you get too much motion at the top in a big wind, and that's not comfortable. Um, and if your beams are not stiff enough, um, they deflect too much. So we, we have to balance how much is enough stiffness versus not enough. So why would we choose a brace frame versus a shear wall or a moment resisting frame? Stiffness is one piece of the puzzle, but there's other reasons. So a moment resisting frame um, tends to be the choice for a lot of buildings because it allows, at least on the exterior, it allows windows. So we have a lot more open space for windows. It is one of the least stiff options, um, but it provides other things that are, that are useful. Um, shear walls are the opposite. No, no options for windows in a shear wall, but we often use them in, in the core of a building. So around elevators and, um, and staircases, we'll put um, shear walls. Um, they're very stiff, and so they'll help us stiffen up the interior of the building. But engineering is all about all these cri uh, competing criteria, so it's not just stiffness, it's also strength, but it's aesthetics and functionality, um, and cost is a big factor. So how you pick different systems will depend on all those um, criteria. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how structures, so putting all these pieces together, how it's changed um, over history. So we've talked a little bit about the early structures in stone, when we talked about beams, we talked about stone. Stone was used in many of the early, early structures. Stone is very strong in compression, so it does a great job with um, arches and vaults and domes. It was very weak in tension. Uh, people did use them for beams, and they used them for buildings, but the spans of the beams tended to be very small, very short, um, again, because it doesn't have very much tension capacity, and those beams rely on both tension and compression. So if you look at a plan view of um, ancient buildings, so examples would be the Parthenon, Temple of Zeus, any of the, the large stone structures. If you look at a plan view, you'll see lots of, lots of columns very closely spaced throughout the building. That's because stone, um, it just the, if it's used for the beams, cannot span very far. You can span a little bit farther when they started using arches. So in many of the cathedrals, they would use arches and vaults, and so the spans got a little greater, heights got a little higher, um, but still you were limited by your material. It wasn't until the 1700s, with the advent of steel and iron, um, that we started to, to be able to span further, so columns were be able to we space them further apart. So we started to get more open space. We started to get taller buildings. Um, so one of the first examples of a steel uh, moment-resisting frame, moment-resisting frames are the most common system used in early buildings, was the Wainwright building in St. Louis. So there were a lot of big buildings going up in St. Louis. If you remove the outer skin of the building, you'll see steel columns and beams. It was designed by Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler. Okay, they just went on to design many um, buildings together. That was one of the first moat resisting frames. Um, there was around that time, around the 1900s, an unofficial skyscraper competition began. Okay, it was mainly New York and Chicago competing, trying to get the, the tallest structure. So the Woolworth building um, is an example of that. It was commissioned by Franklin Woolworth, and the entire goal was to build the tallest building. So Franklin Woolworth paid $13.5 million in cash for the building. It was completed in 1913. It was 241 meters tall, and it was the tallest until 1930. It was designed by engineers Gunvald Oss and Court Barrel. Again, like uh, many of the early buildings, it used a steel moment resisting frame. I think that was again to get a, a lot of windows. And that was one of the first systems that was used. It also was the first building that included an elevator, which is a key to making buildings go taller. Um, so if you want to get buildings taller, we started to have to think about fires and getting people in and out.
The next building completed in 1931 that I want to talk about because it took over as the tallest is the Empire State Building. It was completed in 1931. It was the tallest until 1972. It was designed by William Lamb and Homer Bellicum. Um, one of the keys about this building is the speed with which it was built. It was designed and built in 20 months. So it was kind of when people were starting to use assembly line approach and construction was also using an assembly line approach. It's an iconic building. It was designed in an Art Deco style, so many people recognize it. It's often referred to as the most famous skyscraper in the world. Um, internally, it's using a steel moment resisting frame again to resist those lateral loads. Okay, but it was the tallest for many, many years. Next building I was gonna talk about is the John Hancock Tower. And this never was actually the tallest in the world, but it introduced um, a new type of framing for structures that actually helped structures in general become taller. So it was introduced a tubed structure. So up until then, buildings were um, traditionally very um, regular. So everything was, all the columns were spaced regularly. The John Hancock Tower uses a trust tube. So if you look at the exterior, you'll see X's on the outside, um, and that's a truss on the outside or a tube structure. It was designed by engineer Fosler Kahn with the help of architect Bruce Graham. They both worked for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Fazla Khan, he's a famous engineer. Um, he's known as the father of the tube structure. He's a Bangladeshi American engineer. And he introduced the tube. He was the one that invented and started using a tube structure. So instead of that traditional grid of columns um, placed very regularly throughout the building, he moved everything to the outside of the building. Well, not everything, but most of the columns and the um, lateral force resisting system was moved to the outside. This turns out to be much more efficient and economical. Um, it has to do with the stiffness. So if we go back and think about beams, beams that have all the mass concentrated right at the center were not nearly as stiff as beams that had the mass further away. That's why we use I-beams, why we go to, to forms that have everything moved away from that central axis. It was the same with buildings. So by moving the columns and the uh, lateral force resisting system to the outside, it was more efficient. Fazal Khan also designed the Willis Tower. Um, formerly known as the Sears Tower. It's again a tubed frame system, not with a truss, but still tube frame, so everything on the outside. It was completed in 1973, and it was the tallest for almost 25 years. So the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is currently the tallest building in the world. It's got a height of almost 830 meters, which is huge. It's three times um, the height of the Eiffel Tower, to give you perspective. Um, another way to give you perspective is the weight of the concrete that was used. Um, the weight of the concrete in the building um, is equal to the weight of 100,000 elephants. Another statistic that I found interesting was that 12,000 people uh, worked on the Burj Khalifa during the peak of construction. The Burj Khalifa was designed by engineer Bill Baker and architect Adrian Smith. They're both at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. It's interesting to read about the design. It's based on a flower. Okay. It also uses a bundled tube construction, but it's got these three arms. So it's got a very strong core, and then as it goes up, um, less and less, it tapers, um, somewhat like the Willis Tower. Um, the reason it has these three arms is so it can resist wind in, in any direction. Um, so it has these three arms. It gives it a nice moment of inertia at the base. Um, so you have a strong core and then these arms that extend out to, to give it some, um, some stiffness. So as it tries to tries to bend, it's got stiffness in any direction. That goes back again to beam theory and moment of inertia. There's extensive wind tunnel testing that was done on models of the Burj Khalifa and also detailed computer analyses. Um, it's just an amazing feat and it kind of brings all of our systems together. Um, so we have another video coming up on using glass as a structural material. Go ahead and check that out. And then a couple of final activities for the course.